So today we are going to cover my favorite topic in finance and risk management. It, it's really closely related to my career at USAA. So um, we want to get into this and really get into it in a way that you can see why it's such an exciting topic. It's one of the areas of finance where we actually are quite good at managing this risk. So it's interest rate risk. Remember the template or the model we're going to use is the fine measure mitigate. And so we'll start off defining interest rate risk and look at some background on interest rates to help refresh your memory from your economics class and your 3013 class. Then we'll talk about measurement. We're primarily going to use duration this measurement. We'll talk a little bit about convexity, but we'll primarily use duration. And specifically, we're going to be looking at interest rate risk first at a bank and the interest rate risk that banks take. And so we'll be specifically looking at something called duration of net worth and then mitigation. So the specific tool we're, we're going to use to mitigate interest rate risk is known as balance sheet immunization. And specifically, we'll be doing balance sheet immunization using um, interest rate swaps. All right, so I'm on, I'm on page nine of the class notes. Our first universal risk is interest rate risk. So let's start off with the definition. It's a very simple definition, although uh, the key is that we're looking at both the impact of interest rates on liabilities and assets, not just on assets. So when rates change, when interest rates change, we're looking at the impact on assets and liabilities. And if that impact is inconsistent, obviously assets minus liabilities is net worth. So if assets are impacted differently than net worth, it's possible it could cause us a loss in net worth, especially for very highly levered entities like banks, life insurance companies, and pension plans. And we'll be talking about all three of those. We're going to start talking about banks in particular, but we'll talk about life insurance companies. They're the most complicated of the three by far. Some of you are um, actual science majors in this class and boy, life insurance, it's, it's root where you can really, really add tremendous value uh, by helping them with their interest rate risk because it's, it's a quite complex problem for life insurance companies. And then we're gonna spend a lot more time on pension plans and talking about their interest rate risk. <clears throat> so you have an entity that both assets and liabilities are in some way sensitive to interest rates. And for some reason, they don't react consistently. Maybe assets, interest rates change and it causes your assets to go up 5% causes your liabilities to go up 15%, and now suddenly you're insolvent. <laughs> so how do rates change? So we normally look at 11 points on the yield curve, one month, three months, six months, one year, two, three, five, seven, 10, 15, and 30. Sometimes you'll see two months in there. In fact, the, the Fed site that I use has added two months Sometimes you'll see 20 years instead of 15 years. Sometimes you'll see them both. So it's possible it's 12 or 13 points. Um, but, and it's just, a, it's not just a matter of interest rates going up or down, but it's which interest rates go up. So hopefully you studied this in 3013 or in your economics class when you did mac, um, macroeconomics. But interest rates, the normal interest rate is this orange one. For longer-term rates, this is the 20-year, longer-term rates are higher than short-term rates. Now, this one's not too normal because the short-term rates are very, very, very low, but at least the slope looks about right. Um, one thing we, we uh, I, I think we should do, we'll, we'll look at this so we can, uh, I might add this to today's class, but uh, what the normal distance is between the 10-year and the 1-year or the 10-year and the 2-year. I usually think of the steepness of the year yield curve, looking at 10 versus two. Some people look at 10 versus one, but we'll look at that and get some, some sense of that. <clears throat> and then you might have a steep yield curve where longer term rates are a whole lot higher. Look how much higher the 20 years versus the two year versus the 10. That's the steep yield curve. You might have a flat yield curve where all the rates are essentially the same. Or you might have an inverted yield curve where short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. So hopefully you remember this, but get it into your into your notes. Um, 
if the yield curve is normal, then what we're thinking here is longer term investments, investors need a little bit more rate, a little bit more interest rate to induce them to take the risk of going at that long because they're taking the risk of uh, inflation. And so you got to pay them a little extra. I think this yield curve is actually a little too steep um, versus a normal. We'll see. We'll look at it. So that's normal. If the yield curve is steep, what that means is usually the bond market is signaling very strong growth ahead, maybe some inflation risk. Uh, the Fed's probably going to be raising rates, but they haven't yet. And so the long end starts rising in anticipation of the Fed raising rates to try to slow the economy down, try to take care of inflation. If the yield curve is flat, that usually means essentially the same as inverted, but flat means uh, they, they expect the Fed to cut shorter term rates uh, because of a fear about the economy slowing down and recession. And if it's inverted, really, uh, really that's an, inter that's a, an implication that um, the Fed is going to cut rates. On, even though the Fed really cuts short-term rates, they've tried to manipulate longer-term rates here the last few years, but cut shorter-term rates uh, because they're worried about a recession. They want to pump up the environment. The long end knows they're going to be cutting rates, so the long end just stays down, doesn't move. Um, and an inverted yield curve, we've not had in a recession without an inverted yield curve the year before. So the yield, inverted yield curve is a very good predictor of inflation, I mean, of, an, of recessions. We have had some inverted yield curves without a recession, but every recession we've had has had an inverted yield curve. So it is a very good predictor. I was talking to my favorite economist who teaches at UTSA. Uh, he's here locally at the at, in this, at the San Antonio Fed office, and I was telling them that you, you know it's it's more psychology than it is true. <clears throat> economic impact. The inverted yield curve doesn't really cause a recession. It's simply, re, um, it's simply forecasts. And he said, no, that the inverted yield curve could actually cause, help cause the recession, uh, that it actually has an economic impact. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting. It's not just that the bond market's telling you there's a, there's a, a recession coming, but actually the recession, what's causing a recession is actually causing the yield curve to do these these type of things. So, so yeah, the steepness is usually the two-year versus the ten-year. So I want to talk more about that because I really, really believe U.S. finance majors should fully understand um, this concept of a normal yield curve. So let's let's look at like that. Let's try some let's try some analysis here. So what I have here is back to 1962 daily interest rates for the one year two-year, five-year, and ten-year. I said I have a preference for using the two-year. The two-year doesn't start until 1976, but we'll still, let's look at the um, 10 minus the one. So you take the ten-year yield minus the one-year yield. And let's, we'll look at that, and then let's try the 10 minus the two. We'll copy that down. So 10 minus 1, oops, 10 minus 1, and 10 minus 2. So let's get some statistics here. Let's look at the average, the median, the 90th, the 10th percentile. Let's just look at each one of those. So equal average. So you can see right there, the average is about 100 basis points of the 10-year versus the one or two years. They're about the same. The two, it doesn't go back as far, so that's probably part of the distortion there. Let's look at the median, just in case this is not a normal distribution. The median's a little bit lower, so that means there's some outliers on the steep side that's driving it up a little bit. And then let's look at the 90th percentile. Ah, sorry guys. I could type. So there's your steepest yield curve. And 
Now we'll look at the 10 percentile, and there is your negative yield curve. So let's look at this over time because I think you'll find it interesting as far as yield curve steepness. And put some dates in there. And so I would have these statistics down. You might write them down or even just, just you know, do it yourself and, and have your own data. Um, I'm almost done here. Bill Gates has some defaults that don't make a lot of sense to me. So let's, let's move this to another page so we can just see it. So what we're doing here is we're taking the 10-year yield, minus the one-year yield. And the only reason I'm using the one is because we have more data, but the two is what we normally use. And so up here you have steep yield curves. Down here you have flat or inverted yield curves. You can see, if you go back here and look at the inverted yield curves, you will notice the big recessions here, re big recessions here. There are two recessions right next to each other in the 80s. Uh, a recession here in the early 90s, obviously the 2000 recession, 2006 recession, and even here, which is pretty amazing, in 2019 without any knowledge whatsoever of COVID-19, the yield curve still went negative. So even for 2020, the yield curve predicted a recession in 2020. It's not negative during the recession, it's negative going into the recession. Uh, you'll notice also historically the yield curve has gotten pretty steep coming out. So right now, if you look at the numbers right now, we have a fairly normal yield curve as far as the steepness. So obviously interest rates are really, really low. We've never had rates this low before. But the difference between the short term and the 10 year is about normal. It's a, a little bit flat, but not particularly flat. So the yield curve right now is essentially the, the stock market saying or the bond market saying, Things are somewhat normal as far as economic growth, but you can see last summer, last summer we had an inverted yield curve and that made the press and that was a, a, a big issue. So interest rates, the bond market tells us a lot about the economy, tells us a lot about risk. So have that data, you know, about it's easy to remember, a normal yield curve would be about 100 basis points difference between the 10 year and two year plus or minus 10 basis points. So 80 to 100 would be a normal yield curve. Uh, that's why I said this yield curve is really not all that normal. It's actually pretty steep. Um, I don't know how I built these curves. I might have just pulled this picture um, off of the internet without creating it myself. So somebody else's definition. So actually this yield over curve, you look at the one year at 50 basis points and the 10 year at 200, that's about 150 basis points. That's a little steeper than a normal yield curve. <clears throat> so look at its steepness, try to decide what is the bond market telling you about the economy. The next thing you look at how it shifts. The yield curve can shift in a parallel way. So all interest rates go up together. Um, but it can and more likely it's going to do a non-parallel shift. So you see short-term rates, intermediate term rates, or medium term rates, and long-term rates all move differently. And that's that's what we saw when you look at the chart. You can see uh, yield curves get steeper and they get flatter and they get inverted over time depending on the strength of the economy. And so what you need to do is run scenarios. You need to look at your company or your bank with a rising rate scenario, a falling rate scenario in parallel and yield curve flattening and steepening. Now I want to bring this up as you work on paper one. You are going to most of your banks, if not all of them, will use the term stress test. And these are stress tests. This is related to measurement, um, but you need to understand, you know, the interest rates don't just go up or go down. They go up or down in, in different, different ways, different shifts between long and ter short term rates. So as you're looking at your bank and what it's doing, Think about the stress tests that they do. Did they just do parallel shifts? That's what we're going to do in our scenario just to keep it simple. But do they also look at maybe stochastic analysis where they're running simulations of different types of environments? 
Uh, there are some great resources for looking at historical yields. Um, this one here will give you yields for any year, any time, back many, many years, and you can just compare them. Uh, I really like this one. You know, here uh, I'm looking at 2007 here. You can put any year in. But if you look at 2007, the year before the 2008 financial crisis, you'll quickly notice that the yield curve was inverted. These are short-term rates here, 504, and long-term rates, 485, 492. You can see that the short-term rates were higher than the longer-term rates. And that got even worse. Here, look at 513 versus 478, 467. So before the Great Recession of 2008, the yield curve got in inverted. So you can go back to any year. Uh, if you want to go to the current year, 2020, you can certainly do that. You can see how the yield is amazing where the year started with short-term rates are at 153. And now you come to the end of the year and short-term rates are essentially zero. So that's why I say the yield curve looks fairly normal right now. The 10 year is 93, the one year is at 12 basis points. So we're at a fairly normal, it's a little flat, but not that flat. It's a fairly normal yield curve. The other page you can use is the Federal Reserve. That's where I got all the data that I was, that I was just showing you. If you click on this, you can easily, uh, you just go to download and tell it, Tell it to download, and when you download it, you'll get interest rates for all of those that I just showed you, plus some more. I just brought in the one-year, two-year, and five-year, and 10-year, but you'll get all, all 13, 12, 11 points of the yield curve. You'll notice here, they have, I can get back up to the top here, they have the two-month. I don't normally use the two-month. If you go back historically, the two-month doesn't have much history, and they have the 20-year. I like to use the 15-year, but you know, either is fine, but if you go back far enough in time, the, the two month doesn't even doesn't even register. They don't even have it. So two month I wouldn't recommend. That gives you twelve points. I'm used to the ochre being eleven points. I'm used to not using the two month and I'm used to using the fifteen. But any you know, there's no rules on that how you get the yield curve. It's just, you know, so some people define the steepness of the yield curve as the ten versus the three month. Some do the ten versus the one year. What I've heard most from economists is 10 versus two years, but it just depends. The press likes to use whatever gives them a good story. So when the short side converted, but the one and two year didn't, they talked about the inverted yield curve because, because they got it with the one month versus the 10 year, even though the one year wasn't inverted. So the press will pick whatever number gives them a, gives them a good story. So again, I, I encourage you, and I'll do this a few times throughout this class, is to bring in historical data and figure out what is normal. As I say, it's very important for as you as a college student in, in finance, especially finance majors, but actuarial science majors as well, have some perspective on when you should be shocked, when you should gasp that, wow, that's a really wild number. If you don't have a historical context, then you don't know what's wild. So you're going into an interview and interest rates have changed 0.2%. Is that a big day or is that a small day? The yield curve right now, the 10 year versus the one year is about 80 basis points or 0.8%. Is that normal or is that extreme? If you don't know that, you're gonna have a tough time in interviews when a question comes up and they say, wow, what did you think about the market today? And you're, you're not, you don't really have a clue if it was a big day or not. It must be a big day because they're asking you about it. All right, the next part we wanna talk about is what assets and what liabilities are sensitive to interest rates? So obviously bonds have a direct tie to interest rates. Interest rates rise, bond prices fall. Loans, number four, loans are just the other side of bonds. So a bond is when you're investing to loan someone money. Uh, so loans, um, you know, if you're the one borrowing, then it's a liability for you. If you're the one lending, it's a loan. If you're the one investing, it's a bond. If you're the one borrowing, it's it's a loan. So, you know, anything related to debt, loans, bonds, those are very interest rate sensitive. So the banks you're going to be looking at will have all of these things, loans, debt, and deposits. That's why banks are so sensitive to interest rates. Um, they have deposits on, on the uh, liability side. They have loans on the asset side. They have debt on the liability side. 
they may have some bonds, some treasuries, or other things on the asset side. So a, a, the balance sheet for a bank is extremely interest rate sensitive because both its assets and its liabilities are directly impacted by, by interest rates. Now what about stocks? We're going to use the term duration. Definitely bonds have durations, loans have durations, debt has duration, deposits have durations. But do stocks have duration? By duration we mean a measure of how sensitive is it to interest rates. And if you look at just the basic tool model you use in your um, your 3013 class, you know, back maybe a couple of semesters, or if you took principles of investing, you use the dividend discount model, which it said that a stock is the dividend next year divided by the risk-free interest rate plus beta times the market risk premium minus, minus expected earnings growth for your stock. And there it is right there in the formula, interest rates. So that implies that stocks have very high durations. When interest rates fall, stock prices should zoom up. When interest rates rise, stock prices should fall. But does, do bonds and stocks really react in a similar way to interest rates? And the answer to that is absolutely not. Go back to 2008. In 2008, the, the risk-free rate dropped dramatically in 2008, and yet stocks also dropped dramatically. In 2008. So there's a case where stocks didn't act at, at all like a bond. Interest rates fell and the stock market fell. Um, so, you know, and why is that? And that's because there's a close relationship between interest rates and growth and risk. When do interest rates fall dramatically? They fall dramatically during recessions. So that could help the stock price that the risk free rate has fallen. But market risk premiums will be much higher and expected growth will be much lower. And usually these two will overwhelm this one. So like in 2008, interest rates fell, that helped stock prices. But the market risk premium shot up dramatically. Stocks, people became much more sensitive to risk. And because we we're in a recession, people's expectations for growth fell. And so those two impacts overwhelmed the risk-free impact. So it's an unreliable We'll talk about this when we get into pension plans because it's, I think it's an error that pension plans are making in how they use the stock market to try to hedge their risk in the pension plan. Um, so stocks tend not to be reliable as instruments to invest in if you're trying to mitigate, you know, if you have liabilities that are sensitive to interest rates, stocks are not going to be a good asset to put on the other side of that to try to mitigate the risk of interest rates. What about real estate? Well, real estate like stocks there's several implied relationships. Real estate is simply the present value of future rents. And since the present value uses a discount rate, an interest rate, you would think interest rates falling, real estate should do well. But that relationship really depends on what's going on in the economy and especially what type of real estate you have. So if you did a 20 year office lease to a very high credit quality tenant like a government, you have you know, governments renting out your office space, then that's probably gonna look a lot like a bond. You have a tenant that's gonna pay you no matter what the economy is doing and interest rates have fallen. Um, so that, that property is probably going to do well in a recession. If you have a hotel property where your rents actually change every single day, you're not going to be as sensitive to interest rates. So that's the property has a very short duration. But plus, if you have a retail, office, a retail space that you're renting out, and you go into recession, interest rates fall, and you're in a recession, that property is probably not going to do very well, even though the risk-free rate is falling, your discount rate's falling, you're probably going to, you know, your your assessment of that property and the chances of default and that the, the, the retail customer is not going to be able to pay their lease, that's probably going to affect the property value much more than interest rates falling. So loans, just like bonds, when banks loan out money, um, that is that is very interest rate sensitive. Or if you're the borrower and that's debt, that's very interest rate sensitive. Deposits are a little tricky, and we'll talk a little bit about deposits. Um, deposits are not always as interest rate sensitive as people might think. Uh, checking accounts especially tend to be really sticky. Customers are not that sensitive to interest rates because the checking account, they don't, they don't have a checking account because they're trying to make earn interest. 
have a checking account because it's a transactional account. So it's a little tough. I'll, I'll give you some, some background on that when we get into the actual uh, example. And there are other liabilities. We'll talk about a pension plan liability in particular that is extremely sensitive to interest rates. So these are the type of entities that will really have the most interest rates uh, sensitivity. Banks, especially life insurance companies, they have assets and liabilities that are very sensitive interest rates. Pension plans, definitely. Real estate investment trusts, they can be very sensitive to interest rates. Um, in fact, there are some stocks that tend to have higher dividend yields like real estate investment trusts and utilities. And because they have high dividend yields, they can sometimes be viewed as bond substitutes. And so uh, REITs and utility stocks tend, tend to do well when interest rates fall and tend not to do well when interest rates rise because some people view them as bond substitutes. The Pension Benefit, Benefit Guarantee Corporation, because they take over pension plans of bankrupt companies, they're going to have the same issues that pension plans have. But we're going to start with banks, and then we're going to talk about the others, especially pension plans. We'll spend quite a bit of time talking about pension plans. In fact, you'll have a very big question on one of the exams on uh, balance sheet immunization for pension plans. All right, so there's some background. So now let's talk about measuring. How do we measure a bank's or a life insurance company or a pension plan's sensitivity to changes in interest rates. And there's two main measures, duration and convexity. We are going to ignore convexity when we talk about banks and focus entirely on duration, but when we get to pension plans and life insurance companies, convexity will be a big issue. So duration is a number. Hopefully you've had this before. Hopefully you know how to calculate duration. I'm not going to actually calculate duration in this class. I'm just going to give it to you and then you'll have to use it in your analysis. But it's a very simple number to calculate. It's just the weighted average time to maturity using the discounted cash flows when you're valuing the bond, using those discounted cash flows as your weights. Um, <clears throat> so a bond has many cash flows. All the coupon payments are cash flows. And at the very end of the bond's life, you have a, uh, a principal repayment. And you just take each one of those cash flows each, each period of time, so half a year, one year, one and a half years, two years, and you weight them by the present value of each one of those coupons. And that weighted average time to maturity, that's what duration is. And duration is a powerful tool because it gives us a good estimate of how sensitive an, an asset or a liability is to changes in interest rates. And we just say the percentage change that we expect in an asset or in a liability is minus the duration of the asset or liability times the change in interest rates. We have a minus sign because the assets and liabilities we're looking at, they have an inverse relationship to interest rates. When interest rates fall, their values go up. When interest rates rise, their values come down. All right, so we'll be using this. You'll, we'll be using it not quite exactly in this formula, but something very similar to that. So if a bond portfolio, let's say you're looking at a bond portfolio and it has a duration of five years and you think interest rates are going to rise 1% or 100 basis points, then what would you expect this portfolio to do? It would be minus times the duration, five years, times the change in interest rates. We'd say they're going to rise. So we have a plus sign there and rise 1%. So we'd expect this bond portfolio to fall about 5% if interest rates were to suit up 1% or 100 basis points. If rates were to rise 2%, it would be expected to fall 10%, minus 5 times 0 0.02. If rates were to fall 1.5%, we'd expect the bond price fall. Here we're talking about fall. Then you have minus 5 times minus 0 0.015, and you would get that the bond price should rise 7.5%. <laughs> Now for amortizing loans that pay both interest and principal, the duration is going to be much shorter than the maturity. So if you have a 30 year mortgage, so let's, let's start first with a 30 year treasury. A 30 year treasury only pays interest for 30 years and at the end of 30 years it pays interest and principal. That bond's gonna have a duration probably of 21, 22, 23 years. 
Uh, it won't be 30 years because you're getting all those coupon payments before, so that's going to move the duration closer, uh, further from 30 years and closer to zero. But if you have a mortgage, that 30-year mortgage, because you're paying principal and interest throughout the life, that mortgage may have a duration of only about eight or nine years. That's why mortgages are priced off the 10-year treasury. A 30-year mortgage is priced off the 10-year treasury and not off of the 30-year treasury because they have comparable durations. Now there's different types of duration. Here's something where you can go out and do your own research. Uh, Wikipedia is a great place to go, but you have Macaulay duration, modified duration, and effective duration. Really Macaulay and modified are the same thing. It's exactly this formula that I just gave you up here, weighted average time to maturity. Just modified duration makes one minor adjustment to get, get it more accurate. Um, so they, I, I really think they should have just fixed Macaulay, Macaulay's formula and just called it Macaulay duration, not modified. So, and then you have effective duration. We're not going to get into effective duration. I might talk about it a little bit when we talk about life insurance. But effective duration reflects the fact that some bonds and some liabilities are very complicated. Like a mortgage. I just mentioned a mortgage. A mortgage because the, the borrower can pay off that mortgage early, you really don't know the way to average time of maturity because when interest rates fall, people are going to refinance their mortgage. And that's going to greatly shorten the duration. When interest rates rise, they're not going to pay off their mortgage and they may actually even make smaller payments on the mortgage. So that's going to cause duration to rise. So duration itself <clears throat> is very, very unstable. So you should look up, it'd be a great term to look up uh, effective duration and see some of the terms that come up. One word you'll definitely see when you look at that is the term convexity. So here's the uh, Wikipedia page. They're begging me for money. I'm not going to give them any money, but I do really appreciate what they do. But here's their page on duration. You can see they're talking about modified and Macaulay. Um, and they, they talk about dollar duration. We're going to talk about dollar duration and what we're doing. Uh, there's other durations. The Fisher Well is not one I've used in my career. The key rate duration is one we may talk about some when we get into um, life insurance. Um, effective duration is not specifically here, but it's hinted out. There you see convexity. Uh, spread duration is not a term I, I used in my career, but I was talking to a bond portfolio manager. And he says they do use spread duration. It's a strange term. We won't get it into it in this class, but it's a term you should probably look up. It's a term you're hearing more and more of. So these are just terms you should know when you go into interviews, especially if you're going to interview at a bank or at a life insurance company or a, portfolio, a bond portfolio manager. These are the type of terms that you would want to know. You notice this value at risk. We're definitely going to talk about that. Um, so these are all good terms to, uh, to know, um, and you notice I have some really, really great links in here. Here's the formula I was talking about. It's just so simple. You just All, all you're doing here, the, the formula at the bottom is the formula you use when you price bonds. You use the exact same formula in the numerator. The only difference is you bring time in. So that's why I say it's just a weighted average time to maturity using the, uh, the present value of those cash flows as your weights. So very, very simple formula. There's no reason for a finance major, our actual science major, not to know that formula. Um, and it can get, obviously, get much, much uh, more complicated. Here, while I was talking about duration versus the, the maturity and weighted average life, um, there's, there's good things to know here. If you take the CFA exam, it's a, a chartered uh, financial analyst, exam for investment professionals, uh, you have to know the impact on duration of changing changes in interest rates. So when interest rates fall, durations rise. When interest rates rise, durations fall. You should understand why that is. So there's a lot here you can get into that we're going to ignore in this class because we're focused on, on other things, but I'm just warning you that there are, there, there are things that you would be expected to know if you're in an interview with a bank, with a life insurance company, with a bond portfolio manager. <clears throat> All right, so now let's talk about convexity. Well, convexity 
is the second derivative of the price change versus interest rate changes. It's, it's somewhat like how does duration change as interest rates change. Uh, if you're familiar with options, it's uh, with options you have um, delta and gamma. So duration is like delta and convexity is, is like gamma. So it's like the change in the change. And all you do with this, you get the percentage change in the bond price. You have the same formula we just looked at. And then you add in convexity times the change in yield square divided by 2. When you square convexity, you square the change in yield, which is already a small number. It makes the number much smaller. And then you're dividing by 2. So you'll notice with convexity, convexity is only an issue if interest rates change a bunch. Because this formula really makes this impact really, really small unless interest rates have changed a lot. If interest rates haven't changed much, they've only changed like 1% or 0.5%, then duration is going to dominate. You really don't need to consider convexity at all. That's the reason why we're ignoring convexity when we talk about uh, banks. It tends not to be a big issue for banks, where it is a huge issue for life insurance companies and even bigger issue, or probably an equally big issue for pension plans. So we're going to ignore convexity in here other than discussing it. I do have a file on Blackboard that lets you uh, do some scenarios on duration and convexity. It's an actual calculator. You can plug in different bonds and just see the impact on duration and convexity. I, I would encourage you to try that, experiment some with it. Um, I don't want to spend time on it now because I want to make sure we have plenty of time in this class for other things, but I do encourage you. I, I show that file to my uh, principals investments class. Uh, just to try to whet their appetite to uh, to to what's out there. So uh, as I told them in the class earlier today, boy, this is exciting stuff. Um, this is a whole field of finance. This was my career for a good probably two thirds of my career was working with this, and boy, I loved it because I got to work with actuaries first of all, which are really great people to work with, very quantitative, very serious people, very honest about the statistics. When we don't know something, they, they admit we don't know it, and they're, they're very honest. Uh, but also complicated, but so complicated that if you learn it, you get paid a lot for knowing it. But also so complicated, if you learn it, you can really protect your firm greatly from a lot of risk. And I had a great respect for the actuaries took this stuff seriously to prevent their company from going insolvent for not managing these risks well. So how do you manage these risks well? So we've talked about the definition of interest rate risk. We've talked about how to measure it. So how do we now mitigate it? And we mitigate it in this class using something we call balance sheet immunization. So what is balance sheet immunization? You see that word immunization. And it sounds like a medical term. So you get immunized. You know, everybody's talking about the COVID shot. You take the shot to be immunized. It's not going to keep you from catching the flu or catching COVID, but it should reduce the chances of it by 80, 90 percent. Um, so balance sheet immunization is trying to immunize your balance sheet from changes in interest rates. It will not 100 percent protect you, but it should do a good job of reducing your risk significantly. <clears throat> and what we're trying to do is protect our net worth. Why? Because we have assets and liabilities and they're impacted by interest rates, and if they're not impacted equally, we can really kill net worth. And especially with a bank, you think about a typical bank, they will have assets of maybe $1,000, liabilities of $900, so their net worth is only 10% of their assets. And just, just to show you that, here I have Citigroup. Some of y'all will do Citigroup for paper one. And if you look at Citigroup, they have 1.9, almost $2 trillion in assets, and their net worth is not even $200 billion. So they have more than $10 in assets for every $1 in net worth. Um, so it's, it's pretty amazing. I'm not sure why they're saying gross stockholder equity, 193. <laughs> This total capitalization is including the debt, but um, but their net worth is only 193. So, but it's it's been better. I mean, back in 2017, they had more than 
now they've dropped down. So uh, some of you may have, one good thing you can really research if you want to get into this in more detail, especially if you're interviewing with the bank for the corporate finance side of a bank, is look up um, in, I'm um, doing internet so, so search, maybe use Wikipedia, and look up tier one capital, T-I-E-R one capital, or look up the Basel Accords, I think it's B-A-S-I-L, I can never, never remember how to spell it, but the Basel Accords, uh, those are entities that set up capital requirements for banks. And the Wikipedia will give you a lot of great information before you interview with the bank. So you know more than probably 95% of undergraduate students would, probably even more than, you know, probably 99% of undergraduate finance students if you read up on those type of terms. So the Tier 1 capital, the Basel Accords, those are the kind of things uh, that really explain how big should this number be for net worth versus the assets. But you can see if, if assets were to fall 5%, and liabilities were able to fall 0%, 5% times 2 trillion, you're going to knock out half of your net worth uh, quite quite quickly. Uh, you know, you can't handle that. You, you go insolvent. You need, so if assets fall 5%, you need your liabilities to fall about 5%. If assets rise 5%, you got to make sure your liabilities don't rise 10%. That's not going to work. So, you know, so 5%. Um, Boy, that, that can really wipe out, uh, really wipe out a firm. So balance sheet immunization is trying to match up these assets and liabilities in a way to protect our net worth. Another thing we're going to do, in addition to balance sheet immunization, is we're also going to do dollar duration gap analysis. Now, let me just mention here, I have it in the notes here. Banks don't really use the term dollar duration gap analysis. So if you're in an interview with a the bank, they're not going to know what that means most of the time. Very few of them, if any, will know that term. Dollar duration gap analysis is really something you see with pension plans, not with banks. Um, but I want to show it to you for the banks so when we talk about pension plans, you'll understand it fully. So I'm, I'm throwing it in with the banks because banks are a whole lot easier to deal with on interest rate risk. Uh, than life insurance companies and pension plans are. But if you understand it with the, pen with the bank, you won't have trouble conceptualizing it for a pension plan. <clears throat> so we use the word immunize, not the fees. When you use the word the fees, you mean there's zero risk around. How would you the fees of risk? Well, let's say you owe someone $10,000 in 10 years. And you want to make sure when that 10 years comes up, you have that $10,000. So what you do today is you buy a zero coupon treasury, 10-year treasury bond that matures in exactly 10 years. And its maturity value is exactly $10,000. So you buy that bond today. And in 10 years, you will have exactly $10,000 show up. You'll pay your $10,000 debt. You completely defeat that. Unless the U.S. government goes insolvent, you have nothing to worry about. You don't have any coupon payments to reinvest. You know exactly what you have. That bond's going to be going to mature at $10,000. That's the fees. We can't really do that with a bank. There's just too many other things going on. We can't get it that perfect, but we can certainly get close, like getting a flu shot. We can get it close so that at least your risk of catching the disease is, is much smaller. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about the duration of net worth, and our goal is the move the duration of net worth. Remember, duration is a measure of interest rate exposure. So if the duration of your net worth is zero, essentially what you're saying about that bank is it doesn't matter if rates rise or fall, they should not be impacted. So we're trying to get the duration of net worth closer to zero, not necessarily to zero, but closer to zero. And that's what dollar duration gap does. Dollar duration gap analysis actually gets your net worth duration to exactly zero. All right. Most banks don't really want a duration exactly of zero, especially right now. Banks are worried about rates rising, so they may actually have a negative duration of net worth where they're betting on rates rising. All right, so there is a good intro. Um, some students say, wow, there's anywhere I can go to read more on this. It's possible, but I warn you, um, these are very technically used terms. Um, if you Google them, you might get something that's close, but not quite exactly the same thing. 
So just be, be forewarned. If you're seeing radically different stuff when you do internet searches, you might just click off of it and, and look somewhere else. <clears throat> Now, a lot of banks, board of directors will have this type of mitigation chart. I doubt you're going to see it in the banks you're looking at because they're so large. The banks I dealt with did have these type of, of, of uh, policy statements, but large banks, money center banks like Citibank, uh, like Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, they tend not to be quite this simplistic in their analysis. <clears throat> But what they say is, hey, if interest rates fall 300, 200, 100, or if interest rates rise 100, 200, and 300, how much can our net worth change? So let's first talk about what this 300 is. These are basis points. If you do not understand basis points, learn it right now permanently for the rest of your life. It doesn't matter if you're a finance major or actual science major. You need to understand basis points. So a basis point, if you divide the basis point by 10,000, you get the actual number. So 100 basis points, or take, you take 100 divided by 10,000, and you get 0 0.01. So 100 basis points is 1%. So what they're saying here, if interest rates were to go up 100 basis points, or interest rates would go up 1%. So current interest rates say are 3%. They're asking what happens if interest rates go to 4%. If interest rates rise from 3% to 4%, we do not want our net worth to fall more than 5%. If interest rates go up 200 basis points, or 2%, so they go from 3% to 5%, we don't want our net worth to fall more than 10%. If interest rates rise 300 basis points, we don't want our net worth to fall more than 15%. Now, they always also want that on the bottom side. If interest rates fall, they don't want their, in, their net worth to fall. So they don't care which way interest rates go, whether they go up or go down. They just don't want to lose more than 5, 10, or 15% of their net worth. All right, some students get really confused on this. This is something, think about it. And if this is confusing for you when we have our online, uh, you know, real life uh, class discussions, Make sure to bring this up because some students get really confused and I notice it on the exam They really really struggle with this part of the question. So think about it I can't give you other places to go to check on this because it's it's really not not that well um, Documented on the on the internet. I'm giving you this from my own personal experience working with several different banks <clears throat> Now one thing you can get and this is where students get really confused if you look at this table you can tell that this bank has a target of a max duration of net worth of negative five to positive five years. Now, how can I tell that? Remember the formula, minus duration times the change in interest rates. What they're saying is if your, your duration can be as high as positive five or as low as negative five, but nothing in between. So think about it. Let's, let's take the 100 basis points. So think, remember the formula, minus duration times the change in yields. I don't know why Bill Gates thought I wanted to center that, but I'll take it back to the side. And I don't want that as a... Uh... All right, so... Let's think about that. So here we got minus duration. Duration is 5, and interest rates rise 100 basis points. So what would that do to your net worth? Your net worth would fall 5%, which is the max it can fall. If the duration of your net worth was 6 years, minus 6 times 0 0.01, then your net worth would fall 6%, and you would be out of compliance. So obviously 6 is too high. Five is just right. That's that's the worst you would want, the highest you would want the duration of net worth to be. What if interest rates rise 200 basis points? Well, in that case, your net worth would be expected to fall 10%, and that would be within policy. But if your duration was six years, you would be down 12%. You'd be outside of policy. Same thing with 300 basis points. Five times 0 0.03 gives you minus 15 you would be in compliance. 
Now what about the other side of this? What if the duration of your net worth was minus five years? So then you have minus times minus five. What if interest rates were the fall 100 basis points? In that case, you have minus, minus five, which is positive five, times minus 0.01, that's minus 5%, you would be in compliance. If your duration was negative six years, you would be out of compliance. You'd be negative 6%. All right? So looking at this table, you should be able to tell that the bank has a maximum duration of net worth of five years and a minimum duration of net, year, net worth duration net worth of negative five years. You can just look at the 100 basis point change and whatever that percentage is, you convert that to years, multiply by 100, and that makes it five years, and it's plus or minus five years. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, put this down in your notes that you're not understanding that. If you're not, more than likely several other in the class are having that same issue, and I'll go through it again and try to give you some more, more examples. So what if the duration of net worth was negative six years? I don't know why I started off with negative six years. I should have started off with positive. <clears throat> but like we said, it could not be lower than negative five. It could not be higher than five. But they were actually negative six. What do you need to do? We're going to get into this in more detail. But I would, if I were you, have this printed out next to you when you do these problems. So if the duration of net worth is too low, it's negative six and you don't want it to be more, lower than negative five, you need to increase the duration of assets, you need to decrease the duration of liabilities. So we're gonna get into those, we're gonna see this, don't worry, You're gonna, we're gonna do this again, I'm just introducing the concept to you. This is actually probably too early in the notes for here, but we'll come back to it. But I, was, I just want you to see where we're going that if the bank has a problem, they're going to have to try to manipulate either the duration of their assets or the duration of liabilities. What I want you to think about now, though, is if they try to manipulate the duration of their assets, that's going to disrupt their bank operations. So let's say, okay, we want longer duration of assets. So instead of doing two-year, five-year auto, auto, auto loans, let's do seven-year auto loans. Uh, or instead of doing 10-year home equity loans, let's do 15-year home equity loans. Well. You never want to go to your operations and say, hey, you know, CFO is having problems. Our duration of net worth is too negative. We want you to sell these home equity loans instead of these. No bank wants to do that. They're going to sell what the market is asking for. You don't want to set your interest rates to try to push 15-year home equity loans instead of 10-year home equity loans. If people want 10-year loans, then give them 10-year loans. You don't want the CFO, the finance function, determining what products you, you offer. Same thing on liabilities. On the liability side, your certificates of deposits, your savings accounts. So you need to decrease the duration of your liabilities. So you tell your sales force, hey, don't sell those five-year CDs. Sell those one-year CDs. Well, that's disruptive to their operations. If people want to buy five-year CDs, then they should be able to buy five-year CDs, and the finance function shouldn't mess that up. So... <clears throat> The other thing they could do is, an, is borrow in a different market. So instead of borrowing five years, borrow one year. Borrow commercial paper. Well, that again, the bank doesn't want to do that because the five-year market might be where they normally borrow, and the one-year market doesn't know this bank well at all. So they're not going to get good, good yields, they're good rates at the one-year market. So you don't want to disrupt that either. You don't, even though it's easier to borrow money, in a different market than you know changing how you do certificates of deposits and other deposit accounts it's still disruptive and so what I'm going to show you is pure magic I love interest rate swaps we're going to use interest rate swaps to fix this whole thing we're going to fix the duration of net worth of this firm without having to touch anything related to operations so that's the process we're going through we're going to start off by calculating the duration of net worth we're then going to assess whether it's too high or too low. Depending on whether it's too high or too low, we're going to assess whether duration of assets or liabilities needs to be higher or lower. And then we're going to actually fix the duration of net worth by using interest rate swaps. And we're actually going to do something called duration dollar duration gap analysis to get our duration of net worth exactly to zero. So that's where we're going. 
So I need to introduce to you this concept of a swap. Um, if you haven't had interest rate swaps before, you might you might Google that and look it up, read through in the notes. I think at first you might think it's a little intimidating, um, but once you see it, I think you're going to see that it's really not that difficult. Usually on the exam, about 70-80% of the students have absolutely no trouble with it at all, and I think a few students either didn't study well or anxiety took over and they just, they just panicked during the exam. Uh, you may have had interest rate swaps in another class. It's not always covered. Uh, it's usually only covered in, um, in electives. Some of you might be taking the derivatives class with Brian this semester. If, if that's the case, then uh, you know he's going to go into them in a lot more detail. Um, so you know they're, they're cool things. I really love interest rate swaps. I use them uh, quite a bit at USAA. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the uses we had for them there. Really powerful things. I think I'm going to stop the class class here. And next class, we'll start right there. I'm talking about swaps. And then what we're going to do is do the actual math problems. If you want to get ahead on it, I do have, um, you know, you can actually get ahead by looking at the next in the next class and get ahead. Um, if you want to work the problem, um, <clears throat> before we actually get to it in the class discussion, um, or if you want to get ahead and call me and talk about it, it's a little unusual with everything online. It's hard for me to you know, say get ahead before the class because all you got to do is watch the class in advance. But if for some reason you're, you're ready to do this and I haven't, you don't have the recording yet, which I don't think is really likely, definitely read ahead. Uh, interest rate swaps is something you could Google, and I think a lot of interesting things would come up that would, would give you some great insights. But we'll stop it there. And next class, we'll get into the magic of interest rates.